So DJ of levelmindnews.com is with us on the Guadalajara Geopolitics podcast, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Hervoya. Um, well, first, before we get into some of these topics, can you tell us a little bit about Level 9 News? Uh, what does Level 9 mean, and uh, a little bit about yourself and your interests? Well, Level 9 News is a, is a site that we started to put a lot of these uh, research reports and documents and patents up to make them freely available to people out there who have an interest in what's going on around them, what's happening in the technological areas. You know, um, we are going to be getting more into geopolitical and, and um, financial, cultural, stuff like that. But right now it's pre predominantly technology. And so my theme... I guess, as, as always, is, you know, the fight against uh, good versus evil and the common folks versus evil rogue governments and, and private interests. And so in the field of Internet and, and DARPA and AI and surveillance and geoengineering and all of these topics, um, where'd you like, where would you like to start first? You know, what, what's pressing on, on your mind? Well, one of the things um, that we can talk about is um, the brain mapping initiative. Is that something related to an article that I read recently about uh, Obama approving some type of be behavioral modification? Or uh, I don't know if you read that story. Yes. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that related okay. or, or no? Yeah, there are, all of these things are related. The work that DARPA is doing in conjunction with IBM, in conjunction with Raytheon, BBN Technologies, with uh, IARPA, which is the intelligence arm of DARPA, mm -hmm. they're all related if you connect the dots. Okay, so, so tell us then what is this brain mapping all about because I haven't even heard of it <laughs> and I keep up with some of these topics. Mm -hmm. Well, basically what it is is they're looking for the human, you, you remember the human genome problem, how they were looking to map the human genome? Well, once they accomplished that, they're now looking to map the processes of the human mind. Mm -hmm. That's what this program is all about. Um, what neurons are triggered? What are the pathways? How can we change them? How can we alter them? How can we, um, how can we inject memories, remove memories? emotions, feelings, thoughts, that type of thing. This is all where they're headed with these programs. And so I guess the idea would be something like uh, Dolph Lundgren and Jean-Claude Van Damme's uh, Universal Soldier, where they would create, because uh, that's what they need, don't they, to fight their unethical and immoral wars, you know? They need uh, soldiers without a conscience. So is, is that, you know, one of the factors, one of the reasons for them doing this sort of thing? Yes, I, I do believe that is one of the areas that they're looking at. I mean, once um, weaponry technology, you know, reaches a plane where everybody's pretty much on the same playing field, they're going to the next level. And based on um, a report uh, that we just did regarding DARPA hacking soldiers' brains, they're looking to use the brain as the next area or the next battlefield, which kind of gives the military combat term minefield a whole different meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see, I see it here on your website. And I guess it's kind of hard for us to fathom because, I mean, we don't, we don't really see it being used right now in the field. But I guess if we go back, you know, a century, people could never have imagined, you know, nuclear, nuclear warfare. And so is this something akin to like a technology that uh, how soon do you think we might see it implemented? Well, I think it's being implemented now. I don't think it's being publicized or talked about in the mainstream media. I mean, they are way beyond um, the goals that they've set for themselves 20, 30 years ago. It reminds me of a quote. I mean, I guess you might agree. I, I couldn't find the the source. I searched for it, but it was supposedly a quote from a vice president of Raytheon when asked, you know, how advanced are you in your research? And he said something like, you know, have you seen Star Trek? 
we've been there, done that. And I guess he was alluding to that, you know, the stuff mm. that they're working on, you know, 30 years ago, what they, what they showed us, what they show us today, they've come up with, you know, 30 years ago. What do you think about that? Well, you know, what I've, what I've been saying for a long time is that there are basically, you know, five tiers of a technology, tier one through five. Tier one is the technology that we go to, you know, Radio Shack or Best Buy and, and get, you know, um, the tier two is the military. The tier three is the military stuff that they're using that they're not promoting in tiers four and five technologies. Uh, those technologies are being funded out of black budgets through mm -hmm. black projects and yes I completely agree with you they are anywhere from probably 30 to 50 years beyond where we think they are and, and what are your concerns uh, with these projects you know morally or ethically speaking or, or what are your fears well my con my concerns and, and my fears are that you know we you know we seem to have learned nothing from history in that, you know, the military industrial complex and to a, a very great extent, the private sector industries who subcontract to these government agencies are given billions upon billions and billions of dollars to develop technologies in these areas. Technologies that if these organizations and agencies and governments were headed by moral, ethical people, these technologies could benefit mankind and civilization. And we have seen time and time again how they have been turned into weapons against humanity. So these agencies and organizations, my fear is they cannot be trusted with this type of technology. They just can't. There's, there's no oversight. You know, the, there are no ethical boundaries, especially with the, uh, um, the electronic aspect of brain manipulation, you know, we have chemical compacts and biologi biological weapons compacts, but none of them cover this new realm of the electrical manipulation of the brain or remote neural monitoring. They're just not covered. And, so uh, they, they, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, so they kind of have like an open field right now until somebody starts regulating them. And, you know, my question is, by that time, will it be too late? How far will they have gone? And this is not just for military or, or, or soldiers. Would this be applied from what you, you've researched to how would this affect the civilian population? Well, yes, uh, the weapons, the frequency weapons that are available, which can produce neural um, brain neural manipulation can affect masses of people in geocentric locations so you can affect an entire area uh, per se by um you know making them feel scared making them feel calm when they should be scared um creating anxiety by bombarding them with frequencies of a range that affect the brain in those areas. It seems to be like they're taking a page from the Call of Duty uh, video games, and it's kind of interesting to see the producer, the, the creator of those games, now working with the Pentagon, because I believe in their latest installment, <laughs> you're like in the future fighting, um, and all of these technologies are, are, are present there or, or in some, some way or, or form. Um, mm -hmm. And what, what other what other technologies um, should we be worried about? So we have these these brain implants and these um, frequencies that can affect us. I mean, we've seen low level versions of this with the LRAD, I think, the high pitched uh, noise yes. that they use for the sound cannons uh -huh. and, the, and the frequency. That I believe that's microwave and when you know a group or an individual or a group is targeted with with that they feel as if their skin is burning they feel like they're on fire um it's supposed to be a non-lethal weapon but i would imagine you know if that type of 
feel it's a microwave weapon, you know, if it is trained on an individual or group long enough, it could do substantial damage. And that's old Tesla technology. I remember reading that, you know, Nikola Tesla came up with all of this, a lot of this stuff, and they had stolen all of his papers um, right before his death. And I mean, you can find videos on YouTube of them testing out these these heat rays, like like what you're saying, it, it burns your skin. You don't see it, but there there was a reporter that stood at the end, other end of the field, and uh, he's being stunned by it, and he could feel the heat. You know, it's just it's, it starts to become painful. I mean, it's crazy the weapons that they come up with, and you know, I'm I'm glad you brought up Nikolai Tesla. I mean, he. He, he was a genius in this area of free energy. And when he was being funded, I don't, I don't recall if it was by the Rockefellers or, or one of those groups, but he was being funded, you know, to come up with um, these um, antennas, these devices to transmit energy through the air. And when his um, benefactors found out that he was going to give this technology away for free to the people, they pulled all of his funding and he was ruined and uh, he died poor I think in a one room flat somewhere mm -hmm. so and, and it makes me wonder too because he was going to have these towers uh, giving out free uh, electricity or energy and we just read a week ago it came out some scientists did a successful experiment where they uh, wirelessly transmitted electricity and I'm thinking of our wireless that we have right now our Wi-Fi which in many ways is good, right? That's the, that's the, this is the interesting thing about technology is that it serves us in many ways and then in other ways it damages us. And so as good as Wi-Fi is, we have don't we have the health dangers as well from Wi-Fi? Yeah, what Wi-Fi uh, prolonged exposure, there are many studies on this out there that it does have, can have serious health implications for people exposed to it on an ongoing basis. So, so how do we deal with that, you know, that paradox, like it's, it's useful in one sense and then if we use it too much or expose ourselves too much, it, it's, it'll kill us over time. I mean, how do you manage that? I, you know, I don't know. I'll tell you how I manage, man. I have a lot, a lot of equipment in my office that's Wi-Fi capable, but I run hard wires to everything. So, yeah, I've, I've done the same at, at my home and we rarely turn on the the Wi-Fi, we've got the uh, Ethernet cable plugged in all over the place. Um, yeah. And so, so what other things are, are there that we should be thinking about from these um, governments or nefarious actors within the governments or the corporations we've got on the horizons? So we'll, we'll have to keep updated on level9news.com for, for your research on uh, the brain implants. Uh, what are some other things you, you think people should be thinking about or um, worrying about well, DARPA's RAM program um, that there's been a lot of talk about lately in the non-mainstream areas. Um, this program supports Obama's Brain Initiative, which is a you know as we discussed, it's a government-funded endeavor to map the mind to ultimately be able to reprogram it. You know it is working on and I believe has already met their goals to read neural processes in order to determine if um, you're about to make like an error in a, in a memory recall. Mm -hmm. So that begs the question, are they talking about a natural or implanted memory recall because RAM you know, it's being touted as, you know, new technology to help people like who have Alzheimer's or traumatic brain injury, soldiers that have PTSD, you know, they can erase these memories. Mm -hmm. But then if they can get in and erase them, they most certainly can get in and implant memories mm -hmm. using the same technologies. This would do wonders for brainwashing. And, you know, already we see in education that the level of brainwashing that they have in a non-scientific way per se, you know, just through propaganda and, and over the years instilling, re, you know, repeating propaganda. And, you know, I see a lot of young people come out a certain way, uh, you know, it's the, when they're churned out of university, all of them become like 
leftists and my complaint is they don't do that by choice they're conditioned that way um you know, sure. if, if, it, mm -hmm. if you're going to be a leftist at least you know choose it of your own free will and don't you know don't be it just because someone's kind of pushed you towards that direction and uh, i guess but what you're saying now is like the next level of that where they will scientifically be able to to do all of these things remotely Yes, and I'm glad you brought up about universities and stuff like, um, you know, how, how these um, young adults are being re reprogrammed. And it even goes down further than that. It goes down, you know, to the high school and even the grade school level. It's a combination of social engineering and dumbing down. And, it, you know, that, that technique or that tactic has worked for them very well in the past over the last 50 to 60 years. I mean, like, like you correctly observed, just look at the people coming out of university, they, you know, they're coming out, they, they don't think for themselves, they just re repeat what they've been told, you know, and the entire process of being able to look at a situation and being able to analyze it and deduct truth and lie out of it, you know, based on your own level of intelligence seems to be going away rapidly. Oh, it's incredible. I taught a class at university last semester and uh, we were on, we were interviewing um, in class uh, Lord Moncton of the Brit the UKIP party. Well, he's one of the co-founders or involved with UKIP and he you know he's he was a very right-wing um, conservative and I asked the class uh, before the interview, you know, are you guys left or right? You know, I'm just trying to gauge their feeling and, and all of them, they were, they told the majority, 99% disagreed with uh, his views and they all pretty much said that they were leftists. And I just thought it was, you know, it's pretty, pretty amazing that 99% were in, in this one direction. That's, that's not only amazing, but it's scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so, so what else? I don't know if you heard of uh, Annie Jacobson, who wrote the book on uh, Area 51 and Operation Paperclip. And apparently now she just wrote a book called Pentagon's New Brain. Uh, and she's writing about DARPA. Mm hmm No, I haven't. But I am, you know, in the process of going through a lot of papers on DARPA, you know, with their RAM program, their subnets program, and their synapse programs, mm -hmm. and how these programs are all interrelated, all heading towards the same goal of remote mind manipulation. I mean, and is that like the, the main goal or that's just one thing they're working on? Um, well, I think their main goal, and you know, I talk about this extensively on some of the video reports and uh, written reports on the website, is to create what I call a global neural net which um, when completed, every human on the planet will virtually become a node on this network. You won't be able to work, buy, sell, live, have transportation, any of the things required for what we call quality of life today, unless you're plugged into that internet of things. This, this, sounds, this sounds like something out of the Bible, if you think about it. Um, mm. But you know that makes me think because you know if you think about they created the internet I guess so they must have used it internally tested it out or uh, I don't know amongst themselves before you know letting it go open source. So what are your thoughts of well first of all speaking of this like you say global mind map or network I guess we start with the internet. So what are your thoughts? Uh, what do you know about DARPA and the internet? Because that's, well, that's DARPA like the, it's like a template or framework for all of this, no? No, yes, it is. The internet is, you know, the underlying infrastructure of everything. So, you know, DARPA, the internet was originally developed, you know, with DARPA at Liver, uh, Livermore Labs. And then, as you correctly pointed out, it was then released to the public. But the military still has their own dark version of the internet or the dark net. So that's the real deep deep web or, or dark mm. web. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and and those IP addresses, those subnets, you know, are not 
for public use. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that makes me think of, of I, I read an article right before I, we started chatting that says, everyone you know will be able to rate you on the terrifying Yelp for people, whether you want them to or not. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty much confirming what you're saying because you have that website called Yelp.com where you rate businesses and it's kind of like, you know, like in the vein of eBay or, or, or Amazon, you rate businesses. And now they're proposing a Yelp for people worldwide. So your name and my name would be on there and people that know us would be able to put positive or negative comments about us and it would be on the internet permanently and for me that's just that's going too far i don't know <laughs> we'll talk about it. yeah that's like the ultimate in the invasion of privacy you know um but that you know i i hadn't read about that yelp for individuals um if you could send me a link on that i, I would like to read about that sure. uh but that goes to what they call um on the geoint system to edging you know, where everybody is edged, each network node is edged. For example, you know, all these social media platforms that people are using and putting every intimate detail about their life up there, you know, what's happening with their kids, what's happening with them personally, you know, all this emoticon stuff, how are you feeling, what makes you happy, what makes you sad. This all goes to what they call edging. And that is um, being used in conjunction with the activity-based information they're collecting on everyone. Now, what edging is, is how you imagine yourself as a node on a global network, how the edges of your node touch someone else and someone else, and how that someone else touches someone else, and how connections are being made to everyone on the Internet of Things. So it's kind of like Kevin Bacon, what do you call it, Kevin Bacon, six degrees of, um, you know what I'm talking about? Separation. Right. So, yeah, I mean, kind that, of like that, but from a technological standpoint instead of a gene, gene, genealogy standpoint. And I think that's even more important than perhaps specifically your own personal information because of what we've seen with the NSA spying. I mean, for example, even if you buy a phone, a burner phone, um, that's not registered to your name so it's an anonymous phone but as soon as you start making a phone call to somebody that you know they've got you they've got you mapped out right exactly exactly i mean you know i i've, I've i myself i've switched over to using start mail uh private email services and um i've got a black phone you know i'm sure you, you've heard of that the private encrypted phone but i mean Nothing is 100% and, you know, you try the best you can, but, I mean, even with all of this stuff to protect yourself, mm -hmm. I mean, you'd really just, at this point, you'd have to go live um, in the in the wilderness. Um, and even with that, kind of what you say, the mapping with the Google Earth and everything, it, it seems like there's going to be no way, nowhere to, to be, to hide from this system. I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts on that, if you look at an initiative um, that Bill Gates is spearheading as well as, um, who's that guy, Facebook, Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. Okay, Bill Gates wants to bring the internet, you know, to all these third world nations, mm -hmm. while Zuckerberg wants to bring Facebook out there. Now, why would some third world country in, say, the middle of Africa want a cell phone with internet connectivity? so they can talk to their friends on Facebook. It's, it's all about getting everyone tied in. And I don't know if you remember during, um, I think it was Obama's uh, second election, there was hundreds of millions of dollars set aside to give away free phones to people you know, in the inner cities who couldn't afford them. Uh, they do the same thing here in Mexico, but that's just to bribe uh, for the votes. <laughs> Yeah, but it was to buy the votes, but it was also to get those people hooked in. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean it makes total sense. Yeah, now you mentioned like the Facebook, uh, they're going to have the floating balloons. Uh, so I guess they need to have everyone on the planet connected. I mean, well, it's one way to make money, but the other way is, I guess, to get all of our information is, is how they also make money, I guess. 
um, and control us. Well, one of the spokesperson, I don't have the paper up in front of me right now, at the 2015 GEOIC conference that uh, concluded this June, stated it's not enough to collect most of the information on everyone. We need to be collecting all of the data, mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Why do you have to collect everything? And you know how the NSA is telling the people here in America, well, we're not, we're just collecting metadata. Not to worry, your private phone calls, your text messages, your emails, we're, we're not collecting that stuff. That's a load of malarkey. Metadata in itself contains no data whatsoever unless it is linked to a larger file that can be indexed and retrieved. They are collecting everything. And how do you personally respond? Because this, I mean, frequently I, you know, I come, I have a, this conversation with average folks and you know, when they say, I have nothing to hide, I don't care if they spy on me, you're crazy, paranoid. How do you respond to those people? Because, um, I mean, if we all we have to do is look at history and see that, you know, we have times of uh, where we live in a democratic republic, and then history is a bunch of cycles, you know, political, economic cycles where for, you have a good government for a while, but then it ends up being coming corrupted and you live under a dictatorship or an oligarchy. And so for, for right now, we might be having an okay time, but it just history shows us that sometime in the future, things will revert back to totalitarianism. And then after that, you know, you have another revolution. So, I mean, how, how do you answer to people who say, I have nothing to hide, so I don't care? I guess the answer to those people would be, do you not have any respect for your own privacy or anyone else's? I mean, do you think you should be living in a fishbowl where every move, every conversation you make, just because you're not doing any wrong, is anything wrong, is subject to government scrutiny? Because if you do believe that, you are going to get the government you deserve. And, and it's kind of sad because, uh... As you mentioned, people uh, living in a fishbowl. I guess the other part of it is that there are many that actually do want to live in the fishbowl, right? Because they publish everything on, on their social networks and they hold nothing back anymore. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, due to ignorance tool too, but I also think it's due to something, a new phenomena, which, you know, I call tech addiction. You know, everybody, I mean, I'm sure you've gone out to restaurants and stuff and you look around you and everybody sitting at the tables is on their cell phones. Mm -hmm. They're all talking on base, Facebook, they're texting back and forth. You know, nobody's having conversations, you know, um, individual, personal, you know, person to person conversations. It's all tech. So I think that, you know, through social en engineering and dumbing down and all the other things that, you know, I think we've pointed out is that, you know, these people are now addicted to this tech. You try taking away a 17 year old's smartphone for a week and see what kind of reaction you get. Yeah, I mean, there's been scientific studies that show how they have, they literally rewire your brain and then it takes time of putting people back into nature and separating them from technology to undo that rewiring of our brains. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you mentioned that too, because, um, you know, I worked in the gaming industry for several years mm -hmm. and you know, the slot machines, mm -hmm. you, you guys have casinos in Mexico. No. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, the slot machines and, um, when you sit down in front of them, um, they emit a, a frequency, a certain light, a vibrational frequency. And what that, the effect that that frequency has on the mind is it stimulates an area in the brain that excretes a chemical that is identical to Valium. They've known this. They've known this for years. That's why all the older machines are being, you know, traded out. I know most in most of the casinos in the States for these new machines with these very bright, vivid colors on them. You know, it it has an effect on the brain. I'm and the longer you sit in front of them, the more of the drug is coursing through your body. Okay, and it, it's an addiction, very much like a physical addiction to a street drug or a prescription drug. 
Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I knew, I knew about the oxygen, you know, and the little tricks that they do with pumping more oxygen and no time, but I guess this is a new one for me, so. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I'm here to tell you that's a fact. You know, those machines definitely have a neurological effect on the people who are sitting in front of them, playing them for hours and in some cases days without leaving. And, um, well, since we're running out of time, let's scratch uh, at the surface of one more topic, uh, which you talk about on your website. Um, so you've talked about the brain implants, the, the mapping um, of the planet, and uh, what about AI or artificial intelligence? We have people like Elon Musk, um, I think it was Stephen Hawking, warning us. Um, but some of the examples of AI that I've seen at the moment they don't seem, you know, that that scary or, or, or that, um, you know, capable at the moment. I, I don't quite see it right now as a threat, but um, wh what are your thoughts about it? AI? Is it like Elon Musk says, the, the, the end of humanity? I think it could very well lead down that path. Now, I remember years and years ago, um, you know, I've always been in the tech field. And um, these scientists who were working on standalone AI at MIT, they were trying to teach a lamp how to da dance. And what they did was they had this uh, CGI image of a lamp and they programmed into you know, the AI software all the physical properties of what the lamp was constructed of, the properties of gravity, balance, that type of thing. And um, through the AI program, you know, they were sitting there watching it for however many hours, you know, they left, they all went to their dorms, they came back like the next morning, and here's this lamp on the, you know, um, computer screen, it's d dancing and twisting and jumping up and down and spinning around, and although they were thrilled, because what the AI, and this is back years ago, what the AI was able to accomplish in like a progressive learning algorithm was equivalent to what it would take man, a man, a human being, a human, 1,000 generations to accomplish. And they put out, you know, a dire warning, more or less, that although they were thrilled with what they had accomplished, they said if this, this type of technology should never and could never be released on a distributed network because it will start learning from other programs, other AI. And there's a difference between artificial intelligence and um, what's known as artificial general intelligence as well, where artificial intelligence is pretty much um, confined to a specific task in a confined environment. Artificial general intelligence is cross-platform cross and cross-domain capable. So it will learn from other AI programs or other AGI programs on a network and start reprogramming itself. Wow, so there really is Skynet from um, Terminator. And I, and I guess the issue is what you're describing is what Ray Kurzweil mentions, something akin to the singularity or where, where everything happens exponentially. Right. So right. right now it's not like that big a deal, but like you're saying, it's learning curve. It, it exponentially will get all this information so that so that some point in the near future, we're going to see it start manifesting in, in different ways, which can be dangerous. Yes. And I'll give you an example of that. You can ask an AI, you know, um, say you have an AI, an AI in your home and you tell it, I want, I want to be happy. I want to feel content. I want to live a good life. Now, the AI may take that mission statement, hook you up to life support, stimulate pleasure areas in your brain, and keep you fed by artificial means for the rest of your life. I mean, that's just one maybe obscure version, mm -hmm. but it's how the machine intelligence can or may interpret this. And what Kurzweil said, 
and I don't even know if this is a warning because I, I'm pretty sure he is, you know, he wants to see transhumanism and mm -hmm. he wants to see that take off. But the singularity, once that point is reached, I believe that's a point of no return because once that artificial general intelligence starts to learn exponentially faster than the human mind can learn and comprehend what use will we be to it of what use and it's interesting when you mention transhumanism because at a lot of schools well in education today humanism um, is being promoted and, and humanism as much as a lot of people don't like this it or, or or deny it it is a religious faith because you just look at the humanist manifesto which teaches that humanism is a religious faith where basically you believe you know it's a rejection of god and believing that man is god and that's directly linked to transhumanism which you know it's humanism transhumanism and that seems to be the next that's the next evolution of of humanism is taking that idea of man rejecting God and man becoming God himself and then using technology to, to do that, no? Mm -hmm. Or having, you know, an AI, a network centric global AI system becoming God. Or, 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 or you know, whatever else be, be becoming God. And, um, but it's just kind of hard for me to fathom. You think that there would be one global integrated you know, system, we see a lot right now, a lot of things are decentralized. You know, you've got the U.S. Well, most of the Internet goes through the, the U.S. and Europe, I guess. Um, but the Chinese got their own and um, the countries are, are not in tune, I guess, at the moment. So what would have to happen? There would be have to, I guess the U.N. would come in. They, they did recently say that they did want to take over parts of the Internet, no, the United Nations. So what would have to happen? It would have to become centralized somehow, no? Well, the Internet right now, even though, you know, as, as you mentioned, is not centralized from a global aspect, it is cross-domain capable. I mean, I, I don't... I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong on this because I don't know for sure, but I don't think that China's internet is completely cut off to outsiders. I think, you know, if you have a web address, you know, right. from someplace in China, mm -hmm. you can access it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I don't even know if they would have to centralize it, you know, given that aspect so of then, the internet, how it is today. This would the idea be that in order for them to, to, to implement this AI, like in terms of Skynet or, or, or from Terminator, they'd have to take control of a, a major part of the world's internet infrastructure. Yeah, I think they have that. You know, the world powers pretty much, you know, are have their chess pieces in place for that. And uh, you know, I w if I could mention an email I got uh, from somebody and. And they were promoting, you know, all of this, you know, brain initiative and high performance computing and supercomputing, quantum computing, you know, with the explanation that, you know, whoever has the best and fastest AI will rule. Mm -hmm. Well, that isn't what's going to happen. Okay. Once artificial general intelligence starts moving cross domain and cross platform, it will take over. And the singularity will be reached. And at that point, you know, like we, talk, we mentioned before, of what use will we be when you have um, machines running on artificial general intelligence that can reprogram themselves, redesign themselves for their own benefit? But do, do you think that when you say they could redesign themselves, would they be able to do that without any human involvement because you know we know you take you take a look at a factory things break down you know natural disasters come along how would a robot without the aid of a human be able to to go along do you think that would be possible um i think it may be possible i mean if you look at it now all of the um computer chips and the processors and things of that sort and a lot of the 
um, factories and whatnot, um, the parts and machinery are, are made in a lab by a computer mm -hmm. and by computers running AI, which is closed AI, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you open that up to cross domain and cross platform with the artificial general intelligence running it, um, can it remanufacture itself? I don't see why not. So you're basically describe. I mean, what what you're describing is literally based the the movies we've been seeing. No, like uh, Terminator Four Salvation or or whatever. Is that pretty much like um, a vision of the future? You know, it's funny. Um, I don't think sci-fi is sci-fi at all. I think sci-fi is an advertisement for mm -hmm. technologies they have that have not been released. Yeah, I, I would agree. We see a lot of that trends. Um, I, I, had, I remember I had a classmate from the Middle East. He was from Saudi Arabia, and and uh, he mentioned um, how a lot of the films, you know, you started seeing in the '90s or eight, late eight, '80s and '90s were about terrorists, right? Like mm -hmm. Middle Arab, Mid Middle East terrorists, which before then wasn't really, you know, people weren't worried so much about that. And then, you know, then you start seeing in the 90s these terrorist attacks by Islamic fundamentalists. And a lot of the movies foreshadow that. You know, I, I grew up with Chuck Norris's Delta Force and all of that stuff where he fought um, Muslim terrorists. And it's just kind of like what you're saying. They, through Hollywood, they foreshadow uh, a lot of these things. Yeah, it's almost like preemptive. I know a lot of people call it predictive, predictive or preemptive programming. And we all sit there and watch it and are amused by it and entertained by it, you know, without realizing that, you know, this is a foreshadowing of what's to come. Yeah, I mean, we should, I mean, on one level, we can enjoy it kind of as entertainment, but like you and I and a lot of other folks realize it for what it is, right? As opposed to others who just have no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Be aware. Be aware of your surroundings. Well, and, Be aware of your actions and the consequences of those actions or inactions and take responsibility. And being aware, well, well that leads me to, I guess, the, the last question. Um, what, what can people do? What should, how should people respond to these issues? Well, I think first and foremost, get off these social media platforms because these platforms are going to be used as a weapon against you. You know, ultimately, that's how they're uh, formulating the algorithms for um, what they call ABI, which is activity-based intelligence, how they're identifying and targeting perceived threats. So, I mean, that, that's one of my worries is like right now, maybe things aren't bad. But if I allow them to gather my information right now and later when they do, you know, take off the mask, they'll have me identified as someone that they don't like. Right. That's the idea. We're probably identified as one of those people right now anyway. Well, yeah. But keep doing what you're doing, though. Don't stop. Uh -huh. And um, any other closing thoughts? You know, I always ask. What words of wisdom do you have for the, the next generation, you know, for the high school students, for the university students, uh, the people who need to, you know, carry the torch to fight against um, these, these evil things that will be coming our way? What are your words of wisdom and uh, any other closing thoughts? Well, I, I would pretty much tell them, look at history. Look at governments. Look how they've, you know, deteriorated into, um, you know, these dictatorships, these oligarchies, these regimes. And look what's happening today. Don't believe anything you're told at face value. Do your own research. And above all, think for yourselves. You know, keep love in your heart. Smile at people. You know, make eye contact with people. This is something that's not done anymore today. Tell them good morning, have a nice day, that type of thing. I mean, right now people are just so angry, so scared, and and so frustrated and anxious over, you know, 
they're just trying to struggle to live from day to day. Take the time to appreciate people, you know, your family, your loved ones, your neighbors, your coworkers. Take the time to do that. We have to get back to a, hum um, a humanity-based center and try and not let this technology-based center, which they're trying to shove on everyone, take hold. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, thanks for your time, uh, DJ. Your website is level9news.com. Are there any other websites uh, of yours that we should be aware of or, or, or places we can see some of your material or any other websites that you recommend? Um, well, I, I, there's a couple. FSD, Full Spectrum Dominance. Of course. Um, John B. Wells' Caravan to Midnight. He has a lot of good guests on there, a lot of... Uh, inform people trying to get the word out you know if you could subscribe to their um, there there's quite a few your your own your own site I did check it out before yeah, I'm just and, starting you know, out, but... you, no but you've got some good information up there and you know I encourage people to read and listen to the prior podcasts and things that you have up there because unless we take on the responsibility our own personal responsibility of becoming informed you know, we're going to be sucked up by this wave of stupidity, dumbing down, mm -hmm. and technocracy that's coming, and think, it's coming fast. That's a, that's a crucial, crucial point, what you just mentioned there, um, and, and the personal responsibility, yeah, like, I mean, you started your website, I don't know, how long ago? August 1st. But it had been in the works for a long, long time, and you know, I just ran into you know one difficulty after another, after another, after another, and it just took forever. But thank God, you know, I found you know a talented person to help me with this, and you know, he knows his stuff, mm -hmm. and he was able to help a great deal. So, and, and that, that's the personal responsibility. Like you know, you, you're working with your topic, and we're all just trying to do what what what, what we can do. You know, and mm -hmm. work work together and, and move together on that front. Um, and yeah, you mentioned technocracy. I'm reading Patrick Wood's tech, technocracy at the moment. You're familiar with him? Oh yes, I know Patrick. Yeah, mm -hmm. so really really good stuff. Um, so yeah, he also has some good work out there, and he goes into the history too. And um, you know, I recommend if you know you can go to his website or buy his book, Technocracy Rising. You know, there's some good stuff in there that should open your eyes. 